everyone. Uh, welcome to today's episode of The Differentiators. Uh, in today's episode, we have Arjun Vaidya, who is a, a D2C founder and investor. Uh, he built Dr. Vaidya's, uh, India's largest Ayurveda brand online. Uh, in four years, the brand successfully reached about 1.5 million plus consumers across 500 plus cities and uh, 16,500 plus pin codes in India and launched 80 plus products. So the brand was recently acquired by RP Sanjeev Goenka Group. Uh, he was the first Ayurvedic entrepreneur to be featured in the Forbes 30 under 30 Asia list and Business World 40 under 40 list. Uh, he now leads venture investing for uh, Well Invest in India and also an active angel investor. And uh, he also mentors brands uh, in, in India's D2C ecosystem. So uh, thank you so much, Arjun, for taking your time out. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So my first question is uh, that that I had was why why start an Ayurvedic brand uh, even if you wanted to become an entrepreneur why Ayurveda why not anything else? Yeah, so look, I think for me Ayurveda was pretty easy, right? People think why Ayurveda and uh, Ayurveda is something super old school. So why in the new sort of avatar and generation of digital businesses would you go back to Ayurveda? For me, like, look, my name is Arjun Vedya and Vedya, my last name means Ayurvedic doctor, right? So I come from a legacy of 150 years of Ayurveda, my grandfather, great grandfather and generation before all Ayurvedic doctors. Uh, the legacy of our business was not a business. It was a clinic. So my great grandfather ran an Ayurvedic clinic in uh, Mumbai. Uh, my dada, my grandfather took on that Ayurvedic clinic. Uh, and um, in the late, mid sort of 80s and 90s, he became probably India's most successful Ayurvedic doctor. He saw 300 to 350 patients a day in his clinic, had 5,000 to 10,000 patients on a monthly basis right to him via post. And post was the e-commerce of that time. Uh, but he didn't really care for sales distribution, marketing, or strategy. He was a doctor. He cared for service. He offered a free consultation to all of his patients. Uh, and uh, when my father graduated from college, he wanted to make this into a brand. He wanted to take what my grandfather had in his clinic and take it from hundreds and thousands of customers to millions of customers. Obviously, doctors and businessmen don't see eye to eye. And so eventually, after trying to work together for a year, my dad went his own way and runs a pretty successful business in the jewelry and watch space. Uh, but look, I grew up with asthma. Right? I grew up with juvenile bronchitis. I suffered from asthma. I grew up with pumps, nebulizers, inhalers, steroids. I was not allowed to have Coca-Cola, Limca, Fanta, ice cream growing up, right? Like uh, today's kids don't have any of that. But when I was growing up, kids had that. And so uh, Ayurveda prevented me from having sort of what I call a normal childhood, right? I also uh, wasn't allowed to play cricket. Uh, so I started playing cricket at age five. And by age seven, my grandfather moved me off the cricket field because he said it's too dusty, right? So you can't play cricket. Uh, and so I was the only kid playing golf and squash. And uh, I got cured of asthma pretty much by the age of 15, 15 and a half, after like 13 years of painstaking Ayurvedic treatment for my grandfather. And by 16, I was captain of my school cricket team. Not that it was a great cricket team, not that that many people wanted to play cricket. It was like 20 people wanted to play out of the 10 came to practice, out of the three came to every practice. So I was chosen out of those three, right? But, but I think for me, that was a sort of life-changing moment, right? I became captain of my school cricket team and Ayurveda made me do it. So Ayurveda was not just family legacy. It was something that uh, like meant a lot to me. It had it changed my life. Right? I went to the US to do my undergrad uh, in 2009. I went to Brown University. Uh, I didn't study biotechnology or biochemistry. My grandfather said he would pay for my education if I study biotechnology. I came back after a year having not spent a single hour in a lab. He stopped paying for my education. Uh, I studied economics and politics and, and my dad had to eventually pay. Uh, but my experience in the US sort of shaped the way I think about starting an Ayurveda business, right? So I saw move towards natural organic products. I saw whole foods uh, and I saw customers willing to pay more money for these products. Right? So that was one change. The other thing which I noticed or I was able to see was yoga was completely repackaged, right? Yoga mats, yoga gyms, yoga apparel, Lululemon multi-billion dollar industry in the US and Indian companies had nothing to do with it, right? And so that was really strange to me. Like I'm super patriotic. I wear this band of India on my hand at all times. 
uh, and so I, I i thought to myself like why don't indian companies take Ayur- ayurveda to the world like yoga has been taken from us repackaged and made global but indian companies should take ayurveda to the world and that was the thought process behind why i uh, wanted to start a new age ayurvedic products company i came back to india in 2013 i worked in private equity at a fund called l capital focused on the consumer sector um, and i saw three big changes happen in the consumption sphere right i saw indian consumers who are obsessed with imported products gravitate towards quintessentially indian brands like i was gifted a japanese electronic sharpener for my 11th birthday from a store that only sold imported products i came back to a country where the fund i worked at was an investor in fab india and indians were happy to consume fab india's products right so i think big change there of uh, e-commerce was happening right so i was the youngest member of the team so he said hey like go and work on this thing called e-commerce and so i saw the proliferation of businesses like mintra jabong flipkart amazon zivame bluestone epifry like in the early days of e-commerce 13 14 15 and i knew it was here to stay and ayurveda was undergoing a renaissance right ministry of ayush was created government change hundreds of thousands of customers like you were interested in ayurveda colgate launched herbal toothpaste uh, hindustan lever went back to its ayush range and patanjali revolution was happening right so from a macro perspective it was the perfect storm for an online ayurvedic business from a micro perspective my grandfather passed and i'd made him a promise i'd do something with this legacy so i think basically everything came together and i saw the gap with ayurveda and modern consumers i knew how to take forward my family legacy i was 24 and a half years old and then i went to my i was thinking about this and i went to my dad's 50th birthday in april 2016 uh, there was a small party that his team had thrown for him and i gave a speech there on my dad and my grandfather's nurse of 17 years said to me uh, you're talking about your dad and and good speech and stuff like that but what about your grandfather's legacy are you going to let it die right and by this time my dad had passed his clinic was running as a dispensary so only his patients who had prescriptions would be given the medicine and that was the sort of light switch moment right so this switch just turned on and i said look i have nothing to lose and i have to do this and pretty much that's why i started my ayurveda business so long answer to a short question but i think it encapsulates sort of the reason behind what i did sure yeah i think i think that pretty much answers uh, one of my next questions also because my next question was uh, that i was going to ask was uh, you graduated from brown and you worked as an investment professional uh, in india so i was just wondering if that work experience as an investment professional if, if that helped you gravitate towards uh, if that helped you in in any way possible uh, you know with with your entrepreneurial journey look i think it helps at the context right uh, mm-hmm. i talked about the macro and it helps set that macro context but when i started my company i realized that actually the skills that i got from investing mm-hmm. were very different from the skills required for an entrepreneur right so right. i used to laugh with my team saying nobody like when we were investors everybody answered emails in an entrepreneur nobody answers email so there was a rule in dr vedyas you cannot say i sent an email if if someone doesn't respond to you via email whatsapp sms call uh and any other linkedin then you can say you've exhausted that lead until then you've not exhausted that lead right so i think the hustle of entrepreneurship the resilience the grit of uh, the fight back spirit all of that you don't get it as an as an investor um, and so that i had to learn on the job but setting the macro context i got from my role as an investor uh, yeah arjun uh, starting your uh, dr vaidyas so how did you innovate and differentiate yourself to the changing consumer behaviors Look, interesting question. So I think I started with innovation and Gen Z, and we gravitated to Bharat, right? So we started with saying, "Hey, we're going to launch products for new age millennial consumers," and I consider myself a young consumer. So we launched two products. One was one is called Herbo Fit. It's the goodness of Chavan Prash in a capsule. So it takes away the bitterness, stickiness, and inconvenience of consuming Chavan Prash. Uh, and the second one is called Live It Up Hangover Shield. It's an Ayurvedic hangover supplement, right? So really gen z products new age products right we launched these products offline in late in in early 2017 uh had a big launch event at taj lands and signed up six distributors had 22 sales reps did 10 lakhs of primary sales and i was flying high right i was like a private equity analyst saying 10 lakhs 20 lakhs 30 lakhs 50 lakhs one crore five crore like 
I went to a good school, I had a good job. I I went to a good college, I had a good job out of college. Now I'm running a good business. Like life is easy, right? What I realized very quickly is that uh, primary sales does not mean you're getting paid, right? It means you build a distributor who has to build a retailer who has to build a customer. Only once that customer buys, do you get paid, right? And so three months later, I got nine lakhs worth of this, ten lakhs worth of products back, um, and that was a shock to me. Uh, went back to the drawing board and realized that I didn't have the knowledge. I didn't have the brand recall and I didn't have the differentiation to win in Ayurveda offline. Pivoted the business to Ayurveda online, realized that two products isn't going to cut it, launched another 27 products and launched drvarius.com in November 2017. Uh, from speaking the first year, we basically with a small core team learned online business, right? My wife joined the business. She was in the founding team at Nike, So I convinced her to come on board. Uh, and we started building this online business. We learned Facebook, Google, Shopify, WooCommerce, Ops, Logistics, RTO, COD, like what it takes to build an online business. And realize that actually our customers are not only urban customers. And there's huge scale outside the top 10 cities in India. And that's when Dr. Vedya's transitioned from a Gen Z millennial urban brand to a Bharat brand. And that was the best decision because 82% of our sales actually came from outside the top 10 cities. It wasn't uncommon for Dr. Vedas to advertise in Hindi, English, or vernacular languages. Uh, yeah, you you have answered my next question as well. So, how did you uh, use the uh, infrastructure that was there at that time to transition into an online brand? So, yeah, I think that was answered. Uh, so, the scale that you have achieved is very impressive. And uh, could you take us through the process of Dr. Vaidya's from uh, procurement to the distribution to achieve that scale? Yeah, look, I think uh, Dr. Vaidya's was two phases, right? There was the phase of POC and then there was the phase of scale or hyperscale as I like to call it, right? So it took us two years to fail offline, uh, pivot online, learn online and get to 50 orders a day. November 2018, we got to 50 orders a day on our website. Now today, 50 orders a day seems like nothing, right? But think about 2018 when D2C wasn't a term, right? Today, everybody's talking about D2C. I used to say online first, digital only brand because nobody knew what D2C was, right? At that time. So that first phase of zero to 50 orders was the real heavy lifting, learning, etc. all of that. Uh, when we got to 50 orders a day at like a customer acquisition cost of 30, 35%, Trisha and I both realized this business is really scalable. This is a business, not a hobby. It's not like we're throwing darts and missing. We're we are throwing darts and hitting the board. Maybe not hitting the bullseye, but at least our darts are hitting the board, right? And so now we can scale this. So the next leg of growth was, how can we make this a really large brand? And that was a journey from 50 to 5,000 orders a day, right? Where we started building a brand. We launched multiple SKUs. We hyperscaled our performance marketing. We launched our TikTok, did exceptionally well. I think those were the two phases of scale. I think the first phase was really important. That's where we learned how to do online business. Once you learn online business and you learn, you smell the business, right? From there, scale is, is easy or easier, right? Um, problems are different uh, as you scale a business. But but I think those were the two journeys of or two phases of scale for Dr. Right. Right. Um, so, uh... You know, when you uh, decided to go online, right? Uh, right. Uh, so, how difficult was it to get to fifty orders per day? Uh, I know you mentioned it is uh, right now. It seems nothing, but even back in twenty eighteen, when you learned online, um, you know how how even in twenty eighteen, how difficult was it? How much time it took uh, to get to uh, you know fifty orders per day? Yes, yeah, so I said it took two years, right? Because we started offline and we pivoted online. That took a year, and then mm -hmm. a year to get from there. I think it was really tough really, really tough, right? Because we're living in a different paradigm today. Today, my father places orders on Amazon. Since April 2020, he's placed more than 25 orders on Amazon. Mm -hmm. He goes on his Instagram feed, clicks on a D2C brand and buys a D2C brand. My dad had not placed an order on e-commerce till April 2020. He's the father of an e-commerce entrepreneur, right? Mm -hmm. So 2018 was a different paradigm altogether. You have to convince customers to buy online. If they were convinced to buy with online, they'd buy us. But mm -hmm. to convince customers to buy buy online, right? You have to build the trust, the credibility, 
show that you're a real brand. Um, so we used we leveraged 150 years of legacy a lot um, when when we tried to build the consumer trust. Today, brands are living in a paradigm where there are customers are shopping online, but there are 10 brands. And right. so you have to work to convince the customer to choose you and cut through the clutter. At that time, it was nobody shopping online, convince the offline customer to shop online. Um, right. Especially shopping online was fine. Right? They were okay to consume on Amazon Flipkart, but to come to our website, that was a big challenge. Right. And it took us time to sort that out. Sure. So um, while you were launching, before launching these products, were there any trials that you had to perform uh, to test the efficacy of these products or were they already ready uh, to be consumed by? I think I had the good fortune of the legacy, right? So I had I had like more than 100 FDA approved Ayurvedic formulations tried and tested for like 150 years as mm -hmm. part of my family repository. What we did do is change format, right? So the first company in the world to launch Chavan a Toffee. Hmm. It took our Chavan Prash in a capsule, put that sort of extract into a toffee form and made it fun for kids to have Chavan Prash. So those changes we made with the formulations largely we had. We did have an in-house R&D team as well. Uh, and we did have an in-house lab and all of that. But I think formulations perspective, we, we inherited quite a bit. Hmm. So while you were working on the online business, uh, so how difficult was the day to day? You know, how many hours were you working? Uh, you know, what was the uh, sort of routine like? Look, I think we worked a lot, right? Uh, and we were young founders, so we made the mistake of not building a core team or a strong second layer team quickly. And it took us three years to realize that, right? right. Uh, and so basically, we worked a lot. Uh, I, I, people ask me how it feels to exit. And I say, the great thing is I can sleep at night. For four and a half years, I didn't sleep at night. I was just too paranoid. Right. So I think that is really sort of uh, what we worked really, really hard for a really, really long time. But if I were to reflect on something we could have done better, it, it would have been to build a better core team earlier in the business. Right. Yeah. Uh, so what were the uh, things that you wish you knew when you started the journey? Like you said, uh, building a, uh, a core leadership team or a core team to take it forward. Uh, yeah, I think that is one. The other thing is that Look, you, you see entrepreneurship from the outside, right? And you see press articles, funding rounds, uh, stories of founders that are celebrated. What you don't see is the roller coaster ride that it is, right? And that's why I like to talk about this. I like to talk about failure, grit, resilience, getting back, fight back. That's the real entrepreneurship story. Not just the positive awards and funding rounds and all of that. Like everyone comes back and says, hey, like, you know, Dr. Vedya is so successful, must have been amazing, this, that, whatever. I was like, no. You don't know how much grit, resilience, and fight back it takes to be a founder, right? Because in the early days when Dr. Vedas was not a success, when nobody knew Dr. Vedas, and I would say, hey, I run an Ayurvedic brand called Dr. Vedas, and say, oh, okay, I've never heard of it. In those days, really, building, fighting, struggling, like speaking to people, and they're saying, hey, well, you're too small. I don't want to work with you. I don't want to join your team. I don't want to invest in you. Uh, I don't think you're ready for our product. That is the tough part about entrepreneurship. And I didn't know how difficult it would be mm. uh, until I got into it. So so that's the one thing I wish I knew. Uh, but other than that, look, I really respect the journey. And I think every founder has has an amazing journey and I would not change any part of it. Sure. So so after you launched these brands, uh, I'm sure you would have seeked uh, customer feedback. You would have spoken to a lot of people. So what was that one insight at the beginning? Uh, when you launched a few brands, what is that one insight that you got, or maybe a, a bunch of insights that helped you sort of uh, scale uh, going forward? Look, I think the good part about not having a big team was that basically we did everything right. Mm -hmm. And while everything else that we did may not have been relevant, the one thing that was super relevant was answering the phone. Yeah. So for the first year of Dr. Vedias, pretty much Trisha and I were answering the phone. Mm -hmm. What that allowed us to do was really understand who this customer is, right? Mm -hmm. like what they are, what they want, uh, what we need to improve. I speak to all the best D2C founders through my podcast and all of them say they have to stay close to the customer. The power of D2C is being close to the customer, engaging with the customer, reacting basis what the customer says, right? And so from that perspective, uh, that was the great insight. And, and look, the biggest successful 
the biggest successful launch of Dr. Vedas was a product called Herbo Build. It was an Ayurvedic muscle gain supplement. Sold 2,000 units of a, a day of that product just on our website. The idea of that product came through customer insights. Mm -hmm. Customers said, hey, you have this weight gain pack, uh, but there's nothing Ayurvedic and natural for muscle gain. We want a product. That was the idea behind sort of launching Herbo Build. Um, and that came from customer insights. And today, Herbo Build is still number one bestseller on Amazon in mass gainers and weight gainers and has been for the last 15, 18 months. Now. But customers told us to launch it. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so you're also, uh, you have your own website from where uh, customers buy the, the products and, and also you, you sell on other uh, retailers' website as well. So, uh, where is the the sales, uh, you know, sort of uh, bias towards? Uh, so, is the sales coming more from your own website, or is it from the other retailers? The doctor has adopted a strategy to be website focused because we wanted to control the customer journey and get the customer to buy again and again and again. And also, like Ayurveda is long term, right? So, if you are on a three month course but you buy only one month of medicine, like it won't work for you unless you buy again and again. Hmm. So, we were two third, one third website marketplace. My advice to founders though is go where the customer is. If the mm -hmm. customer prefers buying you on marketplace, go there because at the end of the day, you got to reach the customer. Right. Uh, so, uh, can you tell us few point, pointers for the youngsters who are on, em, embarking on the uh, entrepreneurial journey? Uh, what do they need to do uh, when they start their journey? Yeah, so, I said two things, right, already. I said yeah. grit and resilience, like fight back, that's the power of entrepreneurship. And, if there is one skill you need as a founder, it's that. Second thing I said is build a core team. The third thing, I see a lot of young people I speak to, right? I am doing my full-time job uh, and I'm running this on the side. And uh, eventually, when this becomes big, then I will quit my job, right? Look, we run podcasts. You guys do a podcast. I do a podcast. That's a hobby. Right. You can do a lifestyle business on the side. But if you want to be a really successful founder, you got to be all in. It's okay to not be all in and say, hey, I'm not good. I'm not founder material. I'm not going to be a founder. But if you're a founder, you got to be all in. Because that's the only way you can build a really scalable business. You can build a lifestyle business, right? On the side. You can build a hobby on the side. I'm a marathon runner as a hobby. I'm not going to win the Mumbai marathon, but I'll run the Mumbai marathon. I'm a squash player as a hobby. I run a podcast as a hobby. But building my business, that was my full-time thing. Right. Yeah, that, that uh, actually... Uh, it is actually a very powerful message uh, because even we tried tried doing that and we failed. So, yeah, it's a, it's a powerful message to people out there who are saying, uh, you know, get get your skin in the game. Uh, if you want to if you want to uh, be successful, then you have to be all in. I mean, the odds of succeeding are are anyways less, even if you're if you're all in. Um, so, considering that, uh, doing the doing things on the side and uh, you know expecting to be hugely successful that that could be you know, that does not work out so yeah that's that's a that's a good message to to everyone out there josh uh if you have other questions um yeah i think i can ask about the uh, the current uh, venture capital and the investment landscape right now so uh, what is the trend that is going on and what do you look in, in into the companies that you fund Look, I think the market is hot, right? Like we've had so many unicorns come out of yeah. COVID. So I think things are exciting. It, it, uh, the startup ecosystem has matured in India. Uh, I think a lot of investors are interested. Look, I think the reason that I am an investor now is not because um, of anything else, but just because I've had an exit. I've yeah. been able to sort of take my business to an outcome. And now I feel like this is the way for me to give back, right? Mentor, advise, invest, give back to the ecosystem. So I think uh, what I look at, when I look at consumer businesses is a great founder and a great team, a large addressable market and a great velocity of growth, right? These are the three things that I look at when I look at a business, but I think the investment landscape is exciting. It's hot a um, lot of investment pouring into India. Uh, and, and there's no better time than now to be a founder. Yeah. So, so how was the, the exit? Like, uh, how, how did it come about? So uh, I'm sure you didn't build the business to, get an exit uh you know you wanted to continue this going forward uh but but how was the exit like were you uh, did you like to sell the company or was it was it a bit bit forced sure 
so look i think uh, the first thing you said is very important right do not build a company to sell after yeah. we've sold hundreds of people have come to us and said how do i also sell my business no don't build a company to sell yeah. don't build a company to exit build a company of value when exit comes great if you want to take it great right uh, for us look 2020 was a monumental year mm. uh, covid health and wellness ayurveda plus us being the market leaders we grew much yeah. faster than other people grew right mm. and so uh, i think that was great um, our series a investor rp sanjeev going group actually we eventually exited them uh, i think exit is a very personal decision they made an offer to buy the business we liked the offer um, and so we took their offer uh, some people in my shoes wouldn't have taken it some people in my shoes would have taken it mm. everyone i speak to has different views i think it was a very personal decision and nobody can take that decision other than the founder so when founder asked me should i exit i'm like no you have the answer to that question i can tell you what i thought of but it's your your choice i th- i think we thought the value was fair and and for what we had built in four and a half years b- before the age of 30 i think it was fair value and that's what we took the decision so so after the exit are you still uh, involved with the business in any way no uh, no okay. Okay. you got to rip off the bandaid that's what my dad said <laughs> yeah Sure. So now your your full time uh, goes into this uh, you know the the venture venture firm you're you're working at. So okay. So so what is the what are the ideas? Uh, is it is, is there a specific industry that you look at, uh, or is it a specific technology that you look at uh, as a venture firm uh, when you're investing, or is it is it any idea which is good uh, that deserves to be funded? Look, so Whirl Invest is one of the largest funds in the world. Um, in consumer right uh started as a brand a uh, fund that invests in consumer brands and now does digital businesses e-commerce platforms etc mm-hmm. um so invested in sort of iconic businesses like vitamin water vita coco oatly lazada in india we have a really really exciting portfolio sula viva epigamia purple wakefit byju's and now a pet care retailer called heads up tales right. uh, but that's a growth equity the private equity uh, arm i'm leading the venture arm now Um, so, so more early stage investments. We'll do Series A investments, um, and the areas of focus would be consumer brands, consumer internet, enablers to e-commerce and e-commerce platforms. So, consumer facing businesses largely. That's the area of focus. Sure. But you also do a podcast as a hobby. So, what is the motivation to do do a podcast on the side? Look, I think two things. Right. The first thing is that uh, the podcast is called Direct to a Billion Consumers. Right. The idea was like, e-commerce can actually get you to sixteen and a half thousand pin codes in four and a half years, right? That's what Doctor Vedya was able to do. Right. So there is a new way to get directly to a billion consumers, and right? that was the idea uh, behind what I wanted to tell in terms of stories. And the other was, uh, as a new founder trying to build a consumer business, there is nowhere you can go to hear all of these stories, right? And so I wanted my podcast to specifically be the place that. someone who wants to learn about a consumer brand or a consumer business in india right but right. globally you can learn a lot but in mm-hmm. india there was no place that people could go to to learn about consumer brands d2c e-commerce and i think after like we've had 16 episodes now so right. many founders reach out to me saying before i started i heard your podcast i learned so much from this episode i implemented this in my business that's the idea behind doing it yeah. So Arjun, uh, can you speak about the band on your right hand, the Indian This... band? Ha, huh, that one. So how did you start? When did you start to put it? And yeah, so look, I'm I'm super patriotic, right? I'll, I'll show you my mobile phone cover as well. It's the it's the Indian cricket jersey, and it has my name on it, right? Uh, I'm I'm I've been a sports fan, like I was never good at sports, but I've been a fan of sports. Uh, all my life, and and I'm also super patriotic, right? So I moved back to India straight after college. I didn't mm-hmm. want to stay in the U.S. any longer because I felt like we're privileged people, and we have uh, we have access to resources that other folks don't have, right? And so I started wearing this. One of my friends, um, Pat Jindal, he gave this band to me in 2011 while we were in college, um, and I've been wearing this band since. Uh, proudly Indian was. core to the ethos of dr vedya if you buy a dr vedya's product today you will see proudly written on the front and center um yeah i'm 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 just someone who thinks uh uh very fondly about india i think uh 
patriotism is is a part of my personality and i made it a part of my brand personality as well so uh, so uh, did you also sell other ayurvedic brands on on your website because uh, mm-hmm. in the unorganized sector oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. okay so did you did you any uh, any time think about selling uh, other brands on on your website no it's, it's we didn't think about it okay. so we had a decent range pretty wide Mm-hmm. Um, so I think we were we were fine with just doing our own brand. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think I I don't have any other questions or shares. You have. Uh, I don't have any other questions. I think the discussion was really good. So, and your emphasis on uh, consumer is a very important thing that the entrepreneurs and the businesses should take. Uh, so i think that's a good point to be noted here thank you thank you so sure. thank you thanks arjun thank you so much for for doing this thanks for taking your time out uh, i think it was pretty useful uh, people who were interested in learning about the consumer brand space you know there's definitely a lot of insights from this episode yeah. thank you guys thank you thanks arjun Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning in. We have lots more to come on this channel since we have lined up a few more guests after this. Be sure to like, share and subscribe and hit the bell icon to receive updates. In the description below, I have provided the LinkedIn page link followers on LinkedIn to receive new notifications. So until next time, it's goodbye.